Yes, I think we have done it. Hello, Instagram. Hello, Facebook. Woo, Facebook. Hello. Howdy, everybody. Welcome to the gathering room. Hey, Lauren and Deirdre and ooh, I love that. Melanie and Sarah, yes, and Buffy. Ah, uh, let's see who is coming in on Facebook. There's Leah and Mommy Boopa. Happy Mother's Day. And Lisa and City Lotus. Oh, and Susanna's here from Facebook from Minneapolis. Hello. And Catherine and Vale and Ellen. Hello, hello, Esther. Hello, Cheryl. Hello, Jeb and Natalie and Tracy and Christine. It's so good to see you, Dr. Donna, Amy, Melvin, uh, Andrew. Yay, yay, yay. Hi, hi, Anne, Spider Anne, Kim and Shelly and everybody else. Okay, let's see how many peoples we got. Oh, 80 so far. Ha ha ha. So Hannah's coming and Leah and Kim and Tiffany and Ev and Jessica. Hi, Jessica. And Francis and Ginger and all of the folks. Ooh, Pamela has a cool um, graphic. Okay. We're getting to, the, oh, from the UK, someone's joining us. Happy evening. It's quite late there. How are you all? It's so good to see you. And let us start the gathering room again. I missed last week. I think I was, I don't know, in the bathroom or something. But it's so good to see you guys again. And you're taking time out of a holiday to spend with us on the gathering room. And that holiday is Mother's Day. And for some of you, that's probably the most wonderful day in the world. Your kids bring you pancakes in bed and you call your beloved mother and you just have a powwow about how awesome mothers are and motherhood. And for some of you, it's not a great day. Some of you don't have kids and you wish you did and that sucks on Mother's Day. Some, all of you have mothers, but some of you wish you didn't. <laughs> you know, as they say in therapy, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. And uh, yeah, so if you didn't have a great mother, the, this day can be hard if she was like me to you or whatever. And some of you were good enough mothers who think you're not good enough. And then you feel that this day is a, a mockery of all your efforts. I'm in that club, kind of, but I try not to be. Because I think that good enough is good. But here's the thing. The reason that mothering is such an intense day I mean, sorry, Mother's Day is such an intense day is that there is no bond more deeply wrought than the mother-child bond in all of human experience. And so if it goes just a little bit twee, if it goes off to the side, it can be, it can like really impact us. And when it goes well, when it goes perfectly, it's like heaven. It's like in the whole world is a bounteous and wonderful place. If you always knew you were loved by your very, very good enough mother. So, my point here is that what is the very best can become the very worst, and what is the very worst can become the very best. And this is not just true of mothering situations. This is also true of everything that happens to us. And I am especially reminded of this today because it is also my son Adam's birthday. He turns 34 today. Holy smokes. His birthday originally also came on Mother's Day. So his birthday only coincides with Mother's Day once every 12 years or something. I tried to do the algorithm and I didn't make it. But every very few years, Adam's birthday falls on Mother's Day. And the day he was born happened to be Mother's Day. At some point during his life, when he was a teenager or something, somebody mentioned this to him. And he was like, yeah, that's what I decided. And I was like, Really? He said that? And they said, yeah, he, he decided to choose that day. It was a kind of message and it was a good message. Now, for the people around me, they told me this would be the very worst experience of my life. And in some ways it was because I believed it would be. <laughs> because as you know, whether you've given birth or whether you've just mothered from your heart, whether you're male, female or any other flavor of gender, Loving something the way mothers love their kids is very, very fraught. So in my case, it went a little twee because he was prenatally diagnosed with Down syndrome, as I'm sure almost all of you know. 
And I had to decide very late in the pregnancy what to do about that. And obviously I kept him. It's a little late to reconsider now. Um, so yeah, even though I'm pro-choice, that was what, that was what felt right to me. So this is what I mean by the worst thing. So the worst thing that could have happened to me at that time, I thought was to have a child with an intellectual disability because my entire life was based on intellect. And I hadn't lived long enough, I was 25, I hadn't lived long enough to realize that when the very worst thing happens to you, it's probably the very best thing in disguise. And this has proven true throughout my coaching career. Every time I work with a client, the very worst thing that ever happened to them turns out to be, as they process it, the thing their soul grows from the most and the thing that ultimately brings them the most joy. And I've been, I've been talking to my loved ones about this. Um, Rose's mom is here from Australia and she had a really, really bad nightmare. Well, we did a dream analysis. The way I do dream analysis is that you become the different characters of your dream and I will give you a hint and then you speak as the character from the dream. And I ask the character questions like, okay, monster from the dream, how do you actually feel about the dreamer? Take a nightmare of your own, become the monster and then ask yourself as the monster, what am I trying to teach the dreamer? It will always, the most benevolent messages always come from the scariest demons in the dream. And in Paula's case, it was like, whoa, you're meant to be free and vibrant and alive and take out all the stops and love your life. That was what the monster was saying because the part of her, her ego had cracked down around having too much fun and being too playful. And the monster was shaking up her ego and trying to crack it, which is terrifying, right? But it's everything works that way. Adam's birth shook up my ego and, and cracked it. It cracked my obsession with intellect. It cracked my identifying as, and identifying everyone as their intellects. So it was the absolute best thing that could have happened to me. It just felt like the worst. I'll tell you, one of the few other times that Adam's birthday fell on Mother's Day was also, I think, the 10th anniversary of the Oprah magazine. And I'd been writing for the magazine the whole time it was in publication, except for the first year. So I was invited to the celebration in New York City and Adam came with me. And I remember on his birthday, I, I got up and I spoke to a crowd of, I don't know, like 3000 people, big crowd. And um, there were celebrities there and paparazzi taking pictures. And so I talked about Adam because it was his birthday and then I brought him on stage with me and he got this huge standing ovation wearing an I Love New York t-shirt and he bowed to the crowd and everything and paparazzi said over here Adam and they took his picture and everyone, they, they had told me when he was born you will be so ashamed and the masses will scorn you. And here was so much love, so much attention, so much sweetness. I mean, the paparazzi were being nice. <laughs> That's how much goodness Adam brought into my life. And he told me, you know, uh, I had a dream that I went to a party and I had a golden drink and a beautiful woman kissed me. And I was like, okay, well, he was 21 that day. So it, we did the whole day, all the, all the media stuff and everything. And then we got to go to this party and he was, he was with me. He was getting really tired. It's like, now it's like, 11 o'clock at night and we're still at this rockin' party and people are going through with champagne and Adam was just like, oh, I hate this. And I was like, you know what? You're 21. You get to have a glass of champagne. So I took a glass of champagne for myself. I took one for him. I was like taking a sip. I look around and Adam has drained his champagne Gonk! in one, like he chugged it. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> this is literally the worst thing that could happen. Now I've got a, a a young man with Down syndrome who is both very tired and very drunk. So I ran to the bar and I asked for a Red Bull, which if you've never had one is like crack in a can. And I gave it to Adam and I'm like, drink this fast. And he, Gonk. okay, 
comes up with his eyes spinning in his head. Now I've got a, a young man who is very tired, very drunk and very wired. <laughs> and I'm like, this is so bad. And what happened is that Adam got really relaxed. And who should come strolling over to talk to us but Oprah. And she, she just knows, she's a classy woman. She just knows how to do things. So she sits, she's standing there talking to me. And she just, Adam's standing beside me. And she leans her elbow on his shoulder and just is talking to me, is talking to him. And then she finishes talking to him, mwah, gives him a smooch on the forehead or the cheek and walks away. And he looked at me and he goes, that was my dream. He still remembers that. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah, the worst thing that he could have done became the best thing that could have happened to him that night. Um, that's the way things are. It's the way dreams are. It's the way events are. Roy was just telling me, she was helping me set up and she said, you know, if, I hadn't, if I'd never had a job caretaking for a man with quadriplegia, I wouldn't know how to do all this stuff. And I was like, that is not most people's definition of the best job ever. But it gave her a set of skills that was like the best ever. You look at anything in your life, choose the worst thing, the worst thing in your kitchen, make it the best. The worst thing that's going on at work, your boss's worst traits. If you, if you study it a while, you're gonna find to a way to make it the best thing. And I will tell you what we will talk about this very day. And that is the worst thought in your head. Ha ha, those of you who know me or have been coached by me, already knew I would be talking about the worst thought in your head because frankly, the thoughts in our heads are definitely the worst things that ever happened to us. They're even worse. Like I remember having unanesthetized emergency surgery. It was like a civil war battlefield surgery and I was screaming. Yeah, there was no way to stop screaming. And in retrospect, I realized that the things I was thinking about the surgery were even more painful than the physical surgery. If I'd been knocked out by some kind of anesthesia, it wouldn't have bothered me at all. So the things in our minds are literally the worst thing that happens to us, but that means they can become the best things that happen to us because they have the power to create our experience of life. So here's what I want you to do, like shake it out for a minute. Think of the most depressing or upsetting or um, outraging thought you've had today. Perhaps you've been watching the news. I know my beloved Karen has been watching the news and she comes to every dinner with steam coming out of both nostrils and both ears because the politics are not making her very gruntled. She is disgruntled. Um, I am disgruntled too. I try not to think about it. But if you're thinking about that, if you're thinking about what an awful day Mother's Day could be for you, or if you're thinking about uh, the terrible things that could happen to all of us at any point, just pick the worst, the very worst thought. Now, in my last book, I wrote about Dante going down and down and down through hell until he gets to the center of the earth. And at the center of the earth, he passes, he's still going down. He still goes the same direction, but because he passes the center of the earth, it flips and now he's going up while headed in the same direction. And your worst thought at any given moment is like a kind of port portal that flips. And on one side of it, you're at the depth of hell. And on the other side of it, you're headed away from hell. It becomes your springboard to paradise at that point. As, as Byron Katie likes to say, the mind is like a mirror. It gets things right, but backwards. And what this means is if you have no sense of your purpose, if you don't know what your life is for, if you don't know why you're suffering so much, you always have an ally in your very worst feeling, your very worst experience, your very worst thought. It's always not just showing you something that you could flip, but if it's the worst, it's literally showing you your next step toward enlightenment. So if your worst thought is, you know, everything's going down. This whole world is just a nightmare and we're all going to, you know, perish in a in Armageddon. If that's really your worst thought, first of all, look around and disengage yourself from it, because when you let go, this is the this is how you actually get it to flip. You have to detach from your tight belief in something. So whether it's something awful or whether it's something wonderful, 
let it go and it will get better. And this is where the dualism stops and you get this really interesting thing where one action detachment makes bad things better and makes good things better. So as you detach from something wonderful, it seems to be, it lands in you, it lasts. You can enjoy it completely without fearing its end. And when something's horrible and you detach from it, you, you see that it's passing and it has less power to hurt you. Okay, so if you can detach just a little by checking out whether your thought is literally true, it gives you some wiggle room, and then try the opposite of it. Where This world is actually an incredibly wonderful place. What's the opposite of Armageddon? Um, we're all having a breakthrough to a transformation of consciousness that will make everything so much more wonderful. And all the chaos around us is just many, 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 many portals flipping, 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 flipping so that every little aspect of the world that is negative can turn into something positive. And the deepest suffering you have now, you may look back on surprisingly soon and see as your greatest source of joy. So I hope you're doing that this Mother's Day because it brings up feelings. So when it does, use them. Detach from all of them, enjoy the good ones and take the worst and know that if you sit with it, if you work with it, you will find a way to make it the absolute best thing in your life. So let's look at, uh, oh, people are sending happy birthday wishes to Adam. That's so kind of you and happy birthday to, back to somebody else had a birthday. Um, yeah, somebody said that's a profound message from your son and indeed it is. And he sends all kinds of messages. He's an interesting little cat. I think I told you once I played him the sounds of the planets on the vo that were recorded by the Voyager spaceship as radio waves and turned then into, into sound. And um, he said, what is that sound? And I said, it's the sound the planets make. And he said, oh yeah, that's the call. That's the message. And I said, what's the message? And he said, yeah, the planets are sending us a message. And I said, well, what, uh, what is it? And he said that we're safe. So there you go. You thought you were in danger and in fact, you're safe. So uh, there's a name I can't quite pronounce, but um, she's saying, and it looks like this person may be in Eastern Europe. So how do we take care of ourselves when things look bad and things can look very, very bad. And I don't mean to minimize that at all. There's this weird place where it gets so bad that you have to start trusting that there's good in it or it starts to crush you and there's nothing. It crushes the ego one way or the other. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can change is whether you're identifying with that ego or whether you're identifying more with your soul. So whatever part of you is bigger than this physical body, whatever is extending out there as life, life is in your body. Your body can exist without life. So life is something in there that is not the body. So the, when things look really bad, the one place we have to go is trust in the present moment. And it's, that's how I got through the labor and delivery with Adam, like trusting moment by moment and mo by moment that that moment I'd be all right. And I was, and then I couldn't plan forward from it. Not at that point, but, um, it got me through the present moment, the present moment, the present moment. And I did that for a very long time after he was born too. That's what got me through the first few years. And then I started having so many mystical experiences because when you trust in the present moment, it, it reveals itself as a source of miracles and magic and benevolence. And so many of those things happened to me because I had been forced to trust in the present moment over and over and over that I started to shift my whole view of what the world really was and what bad really is. And I started to look for goodness everywhere and I started to find it. So someone else asks, how does this apply to abuse? First of all, if you are being abused, get out at all costs, get out. You're not supposed to be abused. People aren't supposed to hurt you. Love never hurts, get away from abuse. If you were abused, don't minimize it. Don't say it was nothing. But if you can begin to look at it at the worst best thing, as the worst best thing, you're forced to go into a very deep self-contemplation. 
like you go to the depth of betrayal that a child experiences during a horrible episode of abuse, the deepest kind of betrayal. And what you find there is a little kid with no hope and no abilities. And he or she is living in, or they are living in a world with an evil God. The adults are the gods of that universe. And if they're not good, the world's not good. But here's the thing. People who heal from trauma tend to be more resilient, more cheerful, more able to get through the ordinary good and bad of life than people who did not have any trauma. So it's like the bone heals strongest at the broken places. And that only happens when the bone is set and given time to heal. So if you were abused, get to therapy, get your best friends around you, you know, get to a safe space and give yourself lots of time to heal. But there will come a moment if you can do that, when that little kid at the center of hell starts to find the power to see beyond the world that overwhelmed them at the time. And they begin to see I kind of, well, I'll speak for myself. I don't know. I've, I've worked with a lot of people who've had this too, but my own experience was that um, I remembered a scene of pretty horrific abuse. And I, I remembered myself standing up and I was five, but then something else stood up out of me. And it, it, like, it was like I was much, much bigger than a small child. And I looked down at this scene where someone had done something really bad to me. And I remember thinking, well, now look who you've turned me into. And it shipped like it cracked my ego, it shattered my ego. And as such, it gave me a sense of self that was much more expansive and had, I think that's why I've had so many magical experiences in my life. It pushed me beyond the boundaries of the physical world and gave me a world that is metaphysical as well as physical. And I, I feel like that had to happen. And the time came after many, many years of healing in safe places that it definitely became one of those worst, best things that could ever have happened. Danielle says, I've heard you say before, let it burn away everything. Could you speak more about the bad stuff burning away everything? Yeah, what looks bad to us, um, like in my, the Rose Mom's Nightmare, what looks bad to us is there to burn down what's not us. So in Paula's case, it was burning away everything about her that wasn't playful and joyful. Um, in Rose's case, uh, you know, taking care of a man with quadriplegia, it burned away her assumption that everybody was okay and didn't need help. And as a result, it made her one of the most helpful people I've ever met. Plus, I think it probably gave her some permission, I'll have to check with her, but I think it probably gave her permission to say when she's not doing very well and would like some assistance. You know, she, she was, because that's how the man was with her. He would say, this is what I need, please do it for me. He didn't have any other options. So she learned to be that way. Um, it burned away her, she was young, young at the time, so it burned away her illusions that everything's fine and left her with a profound compassion. Um, when you, you know, when, <laughs> when I left Mormonism, I, I, I moved to Provo, Utah and realized I was a lesbian. Oops. The, the Mormon church, which I was raised in had decreed that the three enemies to the church in the latter days were intellectuals, feminists, and gay people. And I was like, intellectual, I don't know. Feminists, definitely gay. Oops, <laughs> three strikes. It was the worst thing I could be in Provo, Utah in 1994 or whatever it was. And it was the absolute best. People turned their backs on me as I walked down the street, friends, like no. And what I did was it burned away the part of me that thought that it was okay to try to rule people's minds with weird religious stories. I still have a deep faith in the universe, but I don't, I don't feel, Nobody can con me into following a religion I'm not interested in ever again. <laughs> and it burned away the parts of me that were trying to be someone I'm not. And it set me free to love and be loved the way I and my soul needed. 
Dr. Donna says, how do we surface the terrible thoughts in order to shift them to the best when we've developed a coping mechanism of ignoring them and stuffing them away? Well, they're actually, I've been reading a book called No Bad Parts by Richard Schwartz, which is really good, Donna, I'm sure you'd love it. And what he talks about, he's a family systems therapist turned individual therapist. And what he realized is that inside of us are numerous different aspects of self and they aren't just random, they form a system. So you can actually ask to talk to different parts of yourself. And one of the things he does is he says to a part, you know, we know that, we know Marty has some scary memories in here. We'd really like to talk about them to the person who experience the problem but we she needs to go do a speech tomorrow and she can't afford to be overwhelmed are you willing to share in such a way that she won't be overwhelmed and the part that holds the trauma will say mm -hmm, yeah that's fine as long as you pay attention to me and you promise to come back to me i can pace it any way you like so instead of an overwhelming intrusive flashback you get sort of a gradual opening up and you can write it down or speak it to a friend. And if you just ask the part not to flood you, he says he, he's been doing this for years and years and years. And the part that says it won't flood you won't flood you. It's kind of amazing. I, I have to try it on many people. <laughs> I've had it tried on me with a really good therapist. So um, Unique Awakening says, how can I flip the idea that I'm never going to change and I'll never become who I'm meant to be because I keep letting myself down? Okay, this is perfect. First, you wiggle, wiggle, wiggle it like a loose tooth. If you get a Wayfinder coach to come help you, or if you wanna to come to my, um, my I'm doing a, a summer course called uh, Wild New World, and it's about using the magical aspects of yourself to shake loose your suffering. So come to that, it's on my website. Um, but here's how it works, Unique Awakening. You shake up the idea first thought, I'm never going to change. Is that true? I would bet you my last dime that you are slightly different from the person who just signed on to this call like less than half an hour ago. You are changing. Your fingernails are longer. <laughs> you're, you're a little bit more fatigued. You have changed in the last half hour and you'll always continue changing. So you're going to change for sure. And if you're changing a little, why not change a lot? It could happen. The other thought here is I'll never become who I'm meant to be because I keep letting myself down. So we don't have time to shake, shake, shake. That Go with a coach and they can really shake it. But the opposite is going to be I will always become who I'm meant to be because I keep pulling myself up. I mean, what are you doing here? You're pulling yourself up. And I bet you do it a thousand different ways. I have my little paper, my self-help books that I use to pull myself up. I have my friendships and my loved ones that I use to pull myself up. And it's the pulling yourself up that makes you strong, like going to the gym and pulling a weight into the air. It's not getting the weight in the air that you want. It's not being some monolithic good thing. It's the strength you get from pulling yourself up time after time. You're always gonna be who you are meant to be because you're meant to be a human creature who pulls herself or himself up. So unique awakening, you called yourself that for a reason. Okay, Amy says, I'm reading Michael Singer's new book on surrender and acceptance. So if we feel disempowered, we can gain our agency by flipping the worst. How can we do this creatively in wild new ways? Is this the role of artists? Yes, we originally called the wild new worlds. Um, the, the whole course, we called it wild new ways. Turns out somebody else had that title and we had to switch it to wild new world. But it's all about getting into the creativity that is the creativity of all four aspects, body, heart, mind, and soul. And like taking the things that life has handed you as the worst things that happened to you and putting your creativity to work on it. So we've started it here. It's just like wiggle it and flip it and see if you can make it a springboard to paradise. But we're really gonna go through it in the course about how you bring in then your creativity with everything you've learned, the things you've loved learning, the things you've hated learning, the things that have made you stronger, the things that have made you careful, the things that have made you compassionate, and the whole pattern of bad things that happen to you becomes the tapestry of your right life, and it's beautiful. 
So Tammy says, what do you do when you're frustrated with where you're at and you're working toward change, but both give you anxiety and depression and no motivation to move forward, and so having a hard time sleeping? Well, I would start first with the sleeping. I would give myself a little break, like give yourself an official day off from worrying. Let's say you take the next, you don't have to take a whole day, take the next hour and just don't worry about it. Like watch something on TV, give yourself a full on mental break. That's one way you can get a little distance from the thought. So the anxiety and depression piece comes because we just spin and spin and spin. And there's actually a thing in the brain that means we always spin toward more depression and anxiety and not backward. We don't revert without deliberately trying to. So the first step is to get step back and rest. If you have no motivation, you haven't rested enough or you're trying to do the wrong things. And the way you get the perspective to find the right things, the right best thing from the worst thing is you rest. And I know that sounds frustrating. I was saying today, we should all think about the varieties of rest, the different ways we get rest, the different ways we get replenished. Like it's a different rest when you're holding a cat than when you're hiking in the forest. They're, they're both rest. Being just, just lying down near a tree is a special kind of rest that affects your hormones and your pheromones in such a way that your cancer killing cells triple almost immediately. It's amazing. So find varieties of rest and use them. We're a little over time, but I'm just going to keep going. Ooh, oh, Amy says, if you haven't taken a course with MB, that would be me. I encourage you to. So much fun. And Dr. Donna signed up. So thank you guys. Thank you for those votes of confidence. And um, maybe having to change the name in the middle was the absolute best thing that could have happened to that course. So look at today, the worst thing that happened, the worst thought you had, and know that if you treat yourself gently and you rest enough and you detach and you begin to look at it from a different angle, the very worst things you thought were afflicting your day can turn into springboards to paradise. They are all here to make you happy. So happy Mother's Day, everyone, for every reason. And I'll see you again here on The Gathering Room. And, and.